else like you Love is the reason for everything you do Your grace is wide but it's not far We live our lives to tell the world how great you are Sing your praises and we shout your name. of the earth, they rise and fall, but your throne was seated high above them all. This morning we're going to learn a uh, we're going to learn a new song together. I want to I encourage you to sing it out. Uh, the chorus goes like this. I'll play it for you, and then we can maybe try it. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. We try that together. And I will make room for you, to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And I will make room. 
for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to This is my surrender, and here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. Do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Here is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender, this is my surrender, here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt, this is my surrender, and I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you, to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you, to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. the ground of all my tradition and break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. To shake up the ground of all my tradition and break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. The ground of all my tradition and break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. To shake up the ground of all my tradition and break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make 
Your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, well, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire The darkest night You were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God all my life all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God. Hey, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you every. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so every breath that I am able, well, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Though my life you have been faithful Though my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God uh, what, a, what a beautiful song Beautiful in the way that it redirects our minds towards truth I love just the idea of being focused on God's goodness and how that is displayed through different things. It's displayed through just the generosity. He's always giving, always pouring out towards us through his love, through his presence, and just the, the concept of faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and take a seat this morning. Faithfulness is just this powerful concept of, of God remaining true God always doing what he would say he would do, and part of responding to God's goodness is just seeking to actually, actually be faithful with what he's given us. And so as we seek to do that in every way that we can, this morning we get to actually uh, celebrate and to recognize a way of doing that, recognizing that everything God has given us actually belongs to him, and we just want to be faithful. We want to be good stewards of what he has given us. And so this morning, we get to take part in what we refer to as a family or a child dedication, which is just one of those beautiful expressions where a family goes, hey, we've been given these children who are gifts from God, and we want to steward them. We want to be faithful in pointing them back to God towards his love and hoping that they grow up just surrounded by that. And so this morning, we get to do that. And I'm going to welcome up the McMullen family right now. As they come up, you want to uh, welcome them up by giving them a round of applause. Make the trek up the stage. Very good. You're just right here with me. You're just perfect. So this is Nick. This is Danielle. Then we've got Elliot. And we've got Nikki. So uh, excited uh, just to be with this crew. Uh, yeah, boys are doing awesome first five seconds. So this will continue that way. Uh, so, so this is Elliot. Uh, Elliot, he is five. Elliot Thomas. Thomas, which uh, that name comes from. Uh, from a grandfather of just this idea of going, hey, he was a man who was full of faith, full of just this love and dedication for his family and that hope of going, hey, we want to see that just displayed uh, through his life as well. And then God, Nikki, you're already going for a run. I love it, buddy. So Nikki, <laughs> named after dad, uh, Nikki's middle name Solus. It just comes from this concept. It means light. And they have this hope that he would be this boy, this man who radiates light and love just to everyone around him. Uh, so Nikki is three here. And uh, Nick and Danielle just go, hey, uh, we've been connecting here. They've been around Terranova this past year and have this hope that they would raise these boys in a way where they grew up surrounded by the love of God, not just the knowledge of like, oh, yeah, we know information about God, but really want to follow him. And they want to do that as part of this community. And so this morning, they're going to dedicate these boys back to God. And so in a second, we're going to pray for these boys as they do that. We're also going to pray for Nick and Danielle. Uh, you know, just, just parenting. Parenting is a journey. It is not an easy one. And so it's just a way that we will pray for them in their role as parents. And uh, we also, as a church community, we get to play a part of that role. It's just going, hey, nobody has ever intended to follow Jesus alone. And so as their church community, we want to support, we want to encourage, we want to love them in that role. So what we're going to do right now is uh, we're going to pray uh, and do all of that. And uh, just one way just to represent just this like, hey, we are in it. We're behind you guys. We support you. If you feel comfortable, I want to even invite you just to extend a hand towards the family up here. And so I'm going to lead us in praying, and I'm going to invite you to just join me in praying together. And so, God, we just thank you so much just for the gift of these boys that are up here, for Elliot and for Nikki, and for the life and the love and the joy that you've placed in them. And we want to pray that from just this early age, that they would be surrounded not just by information about you, but God, they would have this clear sense that you are with them, that you are a God who is real, who is active in their lives, that your way, like following you, it looks so different and it brings life. And we pray that they would just be drawn to you 
We pray that as they grow up, they would, they would be boys and men who stand out for all the right reasons, just in their generosity and their faithfulness and the way that they love you and follow you. And so we pray that, uh, that they would just enter into that relationship with you. And right now, we want to dedicate Elliot and Nikki back to you, recognizing they are gifts from you. And so we do that. And at the same time, we not only pray for them, but we pray for Nick and Danielle. We pray that in their role as parents to these two, God, you would equip them with all they need. You would give them the patience and the strength. You give them wisdom. Give them just this unending love. You would just equip them in all the ways that they need it and so that they would be able to model you and, uh, and direct these boys towards you. And as their church family, we say yes to just to supporting them, to encouraging them, God, to uh, just standing with them in this journey ahead. And so we want to step into that role as well. God, we thank you for the expression displayed today, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And these guys nailed it. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much. Congratulations. Yeah, you guys, I'm going to well, invite you guys to go ahead and head back to your seat uh, as, uh, as they do. So you want to give them one last round of applause. Nikki's going to clap as well. It's perfect. Perfect. Well, we have just a, a beautiful weekend here at Terra Nova. We have, obviously, the child dedications. We've got a baptism that's happening a little bit later today at John's house. A group that was up serving a meal at the Village of Hope last night. And uh, we're going to have a great time wrapping up our series today. But once more, I want to welcome you to Terra Nova. It is so good just to be together. My name's Scott. I don't think I said that. I said everybody else's name. My name's Scott. Uh, and uh, I'm 38, in case I didn't say that age. So uh, uh, it's, it's super good to be with you at Terra Nova today. Um, if uh, you happen to be newer to Terra Nova, maybe you're a guest or it's one of your first times with us, man, thank you. Uh, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Uh, I hope that you just have a really good experience uh, as you're hanging with us. And uh, probably as you came in the door, we handed you a program. So if you got a program, you could pull this guy out. We communicate a lot of the things that are coming up and going on around Terra Nova through this program. But before you kind of spend time reading through all that stuff, uh, I want to invite you to find the very back of this program. There's this section right here that we call our Connect Card. And so uh, I would encourage you to find that, get folded over, tear it off. And we just love hearing from everybody every single week around here, hearing the good, the bad, the ways that, again, as a church community, we can step in and support and love and encourage each other. And so we invite everybody to fill this out every week. And again, if you're a guest, thanks for being with us. We would love to get a Connect card from you as well. Share as much or as little information as you feel comfortable sharing. If you got questions, if there's things you want to know more about, you can check boxes or let us know. But we'll grab that from you a little bit later on towards the end of our gathering today. And, uh, and as you're working on that, I want to highlight a few things that we've got coming up around here in the weeks to come. And so one of the things that's coming up in just two weeks from today is something called our Terra Nova Tours. Great opportunity to hear more about the heartbeat of Terra Nova, what we're all about. If you've never attended a tour before, love to have you get in play with that. You can write Tour Me on that Connect card that you're working on. Uh, something that's coming up oh, uh, just this upcoming Saturday night is our Trunk or Treat. Trunk or Treat is a great event that we do every year. It's perfect for kids, for young families. If you've got little ones, bring them out next Saturday night. If you've never been to a Saturday night service, this is going to be a great one. And if you go, I don't have kids, you sure I should come out? Yes, we're going to make a great event for our kids and families. And if you want to decorate a trunk or get in play with that, just scan this QR code or write trunk on your Connect card. And another thing that you'll see is that there is a uh, card right around you uh, on your chair letting you know about our One Step Gala. This is a great fundraiser that supports our ministry for single parent families. And so you can get in play with all of those things. But something that we're kicking off this weekend, which you probably saw on the way into here, uh, is we've got our Operation Christmas Child that is beginning this weekend. And this really represents kind of who we are as a church community. We love being a church that seeks to be outward focused, that seeks to love people around us and away from us as best as we can. And as we know we can't do everything, we can step into some things. And this is great. So 
So here's how it works. You'll see that there's boxes in the lobby, and what we want to do is grab one of these boxes, and in the next couple weeks, head out to the stores or uh, buy some different things that you go, you know what, I think some kids would enjoy these toys because these are going to end up being uh, probably the only Christmas present that some children receive this year, and so we want to step into that. You can grab a box or grab two. Uh, If you've got kids, take them with you as you shop and you just display that generosity. You model that with them. And then we want to bring these back. You'll see by November 17th, we're bringing them back in. And so what a great way just to participate and uh, and just to show the love of Jesus through this Christmas season uh, as we get the opportunity to step into that. So we'll have that going on the next few weeks, but grab a uh, shoebox in the lobby on your way out and we'll jump into that. But again, I want to thank you for being with us this morning. And right now, we're actually going to wrap up part five of our series, What Our World Needs Now. Happy Sunday. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. As Scott said, we are in part five. It is the exciting series finale of uh, What Our World Needs Now. And because this is the last week of the series, that means next weekend we're beginning a brand new series. We're getting a series that I'm actually really excited about called While We Wait. And uh, like waiting is hard, right? Nobody likes to wait, uh, whether it's waiting in line at the grocery store or waiting for the doctor to call back with the results waiting is, is hard. And, uh, and these two letters that are written by the Apostle Paul, First and Second Thessalonians, in his correspondence with this uh, Jesus-following community, he's, he's writing to people who are struggling to wait for Jesus to return and make everything right again. And they are suffering a lot of opposition and persecution in their city. Uh, and Some of them have even been killed through the process of this. And they're wondering like, hey, when is Jesus coming back? And when is he going to make all this right again? And what about those who've died? And, and, uh, And Paul is addressing these questions that I think Christians still struggle with today, especially with what's going on in the world and uh, during an election season. Like, hey, is this the end? People ask me, like, hey, do you think the, is this the end times? Is this the end? Is this the end? Uh, and for Paul, the better question to ask is not when. But how will we live while we wait? And so uh, I'm excited for this series, and uh, that's what we're kicking off next weekend. And we're kicking it off, like Scott was saying, on Saturday night with this event that's always just a huge, like a a big highlight in the calendar year for us, the Trunk or Treat thing on Saturday night. So you got kids, come on out and uh, bring some friends, bring some people as we kick off this brand new series next weekend while we wait. There is a really famous scene from Moses' life. It's found uh, in a document known as the book of Exodus. It's part of the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, It's actually part of Torah. And uh, this scene is one of the most famous and actually the most referred to scenes in all of the Hebrew scriptures. And in this scene, to get a feel for it, uh, Moses is leading the people of of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And uh, things are not going well with the people. Uh, He was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. You've seen the movie. Like he was doing that while they were down in the valley breaking all of them. And he's just kind of fed up with the process and he's at an impasse really in the journey. And so he's having this really raw, honest conversation with God. And in the middle of this conversation, he just blurts out, show me your glory. Like, show me your glory. If I could just see who you really are, I could face what I have to face. Show me your glory. And God responds uh, basically with, you can't handle the glory. Like, you can't handle it. Uh, But I love this line. It's such a great line. I will let my goodness pass before you. That's what I'll let you, I'll let you see my goodness. My goodness passed before you, uh, but no one can see me and live. And so uh, God hides Moses in like this crevice, this, uh, this, this crack in the mountain, you know, up on a cliff. And he puts Moses, and like, and then, uh, and then it happens. 
it's like God comes down and passes, in, passes before Moses. And the scene, uh, reading it from, the, from an ancient world, any reader would recognize the context of an ancient royal procession and what that would look and feel like as a king is coming through an area or city and he's got all of his armies dressed in full regalia and all of their conquered victims being dragged along behind the slaves that they've conquered. And, and there, would be, there would be heralds going ahead announcing who this king is and how great he is and all that he's accomplished and everybody he's defeated and all of that. And this scene has some of those overtones, but it's, it's different. It's different in some really significant ways. And so uh, the Lord comes down in a cloud and it's not this, it's not this big, long procession. It's, it's just him. And rather than calling out all of these victories and accomplishments and great things, the voice that calls out is simply declaring the, the character, the glory is the character of God. And here's, here's how this is described. Then the Lord came down in a cloud, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord. Now, when you see, when you're reading in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and you see the Lord in all caps, that is a translation, or more accurately, not a translation, and, and an intentional untranslation of the proper name of God, Yahweh, Yahweh. So that's what's happening in this scene. Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in loyal love and faithfulness. And that phrase right there becomes the most frequently quoted verse or line in all of the scriptures. Not the most frequently quoted verse by people today. In fact, you probably won't even find that one on a coffee cup. But it is the most, it is the most frequently co quoted and riffed on and repeated line or verse by the writers of the scriptures within the scriptures. They are, they are using and reusing and riffing on this line all the time, a description of who God is and who you can expect him to be. And it's especially that that last phrase, that last phrase, abounding in or full of. And the Hebrew words that are used here because he's writing, the story is being told in Hebrew, we translate it into English, are hesed and emet. Full of, abounding in, hesed and emet. And hesed refers to the unfailing love, the devoted love, the committed love, or kindness or mercy of God. And emet it's like truth and firmness and re reliability and faithfulness. This is who God is and who he will always be, completely devoted and unfailingly competent. And that second word, amet, especially, and the whole word family related to amet of like faith, and faithfulness, and having faith, and being faithful. It is one of the most important words in the spiritual life, both with God and with each other. In fact, the word amen is actually part of this word family, and it literally means something like that's truth, or true that, you know, a man like true that, that's truth. And in English, we have a bunch of different word families to capture this idea. So there's the believe, beliefs, believable word family, that's one. And then there's the faith and having faith and faithful, faithfulness. And then there's true and trust and truth and trustworthy and that word family. And all of those kind of overlap with this concept and overlap with this word and are used variously in our, in, in our translations as an action, for example, we would say, like, I believe or I trust in or I have faith in someone or something. I believe that. I trust. I, I have faith. Uh, and then the content of what we believe, we would say, well, that's whether it's of an idea or an organization or person, the, that's my belief or that's my beliefs about that or my faith or my, we might just call it the truth. That's, that's what I believe is the truth. And the object of the thing we believe in well, we believe in it or we trust that or we, we have faith in that because, well, we, it's believable, it's trustworthy, it's faithful. Or we might just use this word right here. It's true. That's true. And when that word, that's a great word. When that word is used of an idea, uh, we're saying that idea is, is accurate. It reflects or, or, or represents reality correctly. You can count on that. It's true. Uh, when we use the word true to refer to a thing, and, and maybe you don't use it this way very often, but if you're in the construction business or anything like that, this is a word that's frequently used for like a board or a wall or a floor or a frame to be true. When something's true, it's what? It's like plumb, it's straight, it's level, it's square. It is what it's supposed to be. And if, you're, if you work in that industry at all, you, you know like, 
nothing's ever true. Like it's never true. The wall's never true. The flood, right? Uh, but if it is true, it's like that's what it needs to be. That's what you can count on. And when that word is used as a, a, of a person, well, it kind of means the same thing. A person who's true or true to their word, they are who they need to be, that, that, that you can count on them, that's true. And when a met, when this word a met is used of a person or if it's, when it's used of God, it, means things, it refers to things like reliability, constancy, I love that, constancy, faithfulness, trustworthiness, honesty, stability, truth. And, and when, we, when we say that God is a met, we're saying, well, he's true. He's true, and you can count on that. And when we trust him to be so, and then we behave in that, because trust or belief, it's an action word. It implies a response, right? And when we trust in him to be so, and then we behave into that, so we're following him, we're following what he said, we're following how he's leading us, we're leaning into him, we're obeying him, doing as he leads, even before we see the outcomes, because that's what the trust is. Like, I believe you're going to show up, and so I'm going to act as if you are. Then we become steady and stable and reliable, not just trusting, but trustful, not just faithing, if you will, but faithful and trustworthy to God, like God can count on me because that is who I am. And this idea, this really big idea, it plays out not just vertically, but horizontally as well. And though this may not be like the way you've ever thought about faith, or I believe, or I have my beliefs, this is the worldview, not only of the Hebrew scriptures, it's the worldview of Jesus and his first followers. And so the idea goes like this. So, uh, so I trust God, you know, this vertical plane, like I trust God. And so I behave in trust because that's what that implies. And therefore I am faithful and trustworthy to God. And so I am becoming a person, not just a person of faith and trust. I am becoming faithful, steady and reliable. And because I'm becoming steady and reliable, people can count on me. They can count on me all the time because I'm a person of truth. I am true, if you will. I'm true to people. I'm true to you. I'm true to my word. For example, there's something that Jesus taught that you may have read before. If you've ever read much about Jesus, you may have read him saying this and then just like read right, right past it because it's like, well, that was kind of weird. I wonder if there's something else in here. And here's this moment where he's teaching and he says this. He says, again, You've heard it was said to the people long ago, and he's referring to their laws and traditions that they were rooted in. Do not break your oath, but fulfill the, to the Lord the vows that you have made. And the idea is when you give your word and then you swear it. So I said something and then I swore it and, I'm, and I swore it under oath and I actually made a vow to the Lord. Like this is true and I make a vow to the Lord. Well then, in their tradition, Man, you better keep that. Like if it costs you everything, including your life, you keep the vow that you made to the Lord. And Jesus says, but I tell you, don't do that. Don't do any of that. Don't swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by earth, for it's in Switzerland, or by Jerusalem, it's the city of the great king. And don't even swear by your own head, because you can't even control your hair, like your hair color. Like you can't even change. Like, so don't, and, and here's, the, here's the point, and all this sounds kind of strange, like that's why you just kept reading past it. These are all degrees of swearing oaths. Like different levels of what you swore by reflected like how serious you were and how maybe how truthful you're being. So like I swear by my own head or I swear by the temple in Jerusalem. Like, oh, that, that must be serious. And, and as strange as that is, like we have a similar deal, right? We, we really do. And so we say when we're trying to convince people like, no, I swear, I swear it. I promise on your mother's grave. On my mother's grave? What are you... Are you crazy? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I swear on my mother's grave. I cross my heart. Do you hope to die? Do I hope? No, I don't hope to. Do I hope to die? Yeah. If you're not telling the truth, do you hope you'll die? Well, let me think about it. Right. And, and so, really, all of that, all of that kind of nonsense, all of that swearing and double crossing and hoping to die, it's all about: Are you telling the truth? Is what you're saying true, like steady and reliable? Can I believe you? Can I really trust you? And Jesus says, none of that, none of that. Simply let your word be yes for yes 
and no for no, anything else, all of that playing with levels of honesty and such, all of that is just shades and degrees of everything that's messed up in this broken world. In other words, here's what he's saying. He's, saying, he's not saying, don't ever you know, swear in court that you'll tell the truth and the whole truth. That's really not the point. The point is so much bigger and frankly harder than that. He's saying, be a person of such integrity and truth that the fact that you said it is all that needs to be said. Be known and so established in your own integrity that the fact that you said it, oh, John said that, well, it must be true. Oh, he, oh Joe said he was going to show up. He's going to show up. Like, you can count on that, and everything else is just playing with truth. So I'm a person, back to our diagram, I'm a person of truth. I am true, and therefore, I am trustworthy to others. I'm true to you, I'm true to my word, I'm true to people, and I am trustworthy to them. So today we're wrapping up this series called What Our World Needs Now, and we all have ideas about what we think our world needs, and our politicians, and our, the political pundits, and the various parties, they certainly all have their ideas about what the world needs right now. But Jesus once said something about what our world needs that I really believe still holds true, and according to Jesus, what our world needs now is actually you and me and us to be who we really are. And here's how we've been putting it throughout this series. What our world needs now is for Christians to actually be Christ-like and bigger than that, more than that, not just one-offs or in isolated occasions, but for whole Jesus-following communities like ours, for whole Jesus-following communities to be Jesus-like, to actually follow Jesus the way he is and was. But that raises a question, and this has kind of been the question of our series, if you've been around, like, so what does that look like? Okay, so that's, a, that's kind of a cool thing to say, but what does Christ like, look like, and act like, and react like? And to get at that, we've been looking at this famous, maybe uh, actually a little too famous uh, line. In fact, I say too famous because when things become really familiar, we just kind of blow right by them, right? And this is this famous or, or often familiar verbal character portrait that was developed by a man named Paul or the Apostle Paul, St. Paul. And it's often referred to as the fruit of the Spirit because he refers to it that way. And, and, and the idea of this metaphor is, it, like picture this, this is what should naturally and organically, like if everything's happening the way it's supposed to, this is what should be naturally and organically growing inside of and then out of people whose lives are aligned with God's Spirit, who say they are following Jesus or walking with God's Spirit as He guides us, His Spirit in us and around us. And, and this description, I mean, it is what our world needs not right now. Our world needs, for example, people, maybe all people, but hey, we can't tell all people what to do especially Christians, for Christians to be first and foremost people of love, people of love, people who are love, filled with love, motivated by love, like that's their primary driving force. And so they are always acting in love, or you might say in the best interest of the other. They are motivated and therefore acting in love, and they are people of joy, all of them, all of these Christian people, they just, they're not just joyful people, they're enjoyable. Like they bring joy to the room, they carry it with them. Like everywhere they go, it's like, here, I got joy, enough to share, I've got, and we elevate the, like we, we bring the joy home, we bring it to work, we bring it to the HOA, we bring it to the freeway. Like everywhere we go, we're bringing the joy. And what our world needs right now, we said in week three, is people of peace people of peace, people whose inner lives or inward experiences is one of shalom. That's the word we learned a couple weeks ago, which means like completeness, wholeness, everything is the way it's supposed to be inside of me, right? And so I, because that's who I am, that's what I bring. I just bring peace. I bring the shalom, uh, sowing seeds of peace, never sowing seeds of fear, or hostility, or animosity, or us versus them, just sowing seeds of shalom and peace, peacemakers, peace bringers, and what our world needs now. As we said uh, last week, Paul mentions these three things in a row, and they actually really go together. People who are patient and kind and good. And, and people, we said, we camped out in this middle term because it encompasses both the patience, the forbearing, the long-suffering, the grit of patience, and also the doing good, not just being good, of goodness, that there's an active generosity to these people, meaning that when it's least expected and least deserved, 
they do the kind thing. They do and say, they say the kind thing. They say the thing that will be helpful and beneficial in this moment. Though sometimes what's truly helpful to a person or in a moment requires a whole lot of wisdom and a whole lot of creativity. This is not the same as simply being nice or polite, though the world could use a little bit more of that too. It is way bigger than that. It's better, it's more robust, and it's frankly a lot more challenging than that. What our world needs now is people of kindness, whose lives with others exude kindness. But perhaps none of these character traits is under as great a threat of being lost as faithfulness. Faithfulness. In fact, study after study has shown that uh, over the last decades, I mean, there are so many, so many, so many studies, the trust in government and in institutions and people is at an all-time low. And it's not just government, it's our trust in American institutions uh, like banks uh, and public schools and news, news organizations. Do we trust them? No, we don't. Uh, and then at the very bottom of the pile, big business and Congress. And, and like the companies we work for, like they're not loyal to us. Why would we be loyal to them? And one of the things that comes out of this is the rise in conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. In fact, I was listening to a futurist on a podcast. You know, futurists are, um, are sociologists who study global and uh, large scale trends, national trends. And they kind of say, here are changes that are happening in a, on a massive scale that affect what will happen in the future. And so I was listening to this future and he was futurist and he was talking about conspiracy theories and the rise in the past decade or so of conspiracy theories. And he was saying that the more disempowered people feel, because things, are more, things feel more global, they feel further out of our reach than they probably ever felt, and so we feel disempowered, even in a democracy. We're like, I'm going to vote for somebody, but I mean, yeah, our vote matters, but really, I mean, and so the more disempowered we feel and the less that we believe that these massively large systems and institutions might have our best interests at heart, no. No, they don't. Then the more suspicion we have, the more suspicion we have of what might go on behind closed doors, and we know stuff goes on behind closed doors, and what they might be hiding from us, and we know we're not always being told the truth. And, 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 and as a result of that, like thinking that you might have the secret like of that cabal or those powerful people, and I know who's really pulling the strings, and I know what's really going on, just gives people at least a little bit of a sense of power or control. And there's this general widespread malaise of distrust, distrust, distrust. And this leaks out not only in our views of government and business and news organizations and institutions, it leaks out in our views of uh, our, our trust in or lack of trust in, in people in general, other people and even each other, and then that leaks into our lives and our character. And we have become, and like studies just track this, we have become intensely self-protecting. Of course, if I can't trust anybody else, if I can't trust anybody to have my back, I need to protect myself and as a result, isolated and disconnected from people and from community and we don't like this word, but it really is true, self-serving, self-protective and self-serving captured in that iconic phrase from our cultural moment, you do you. Hey, you do you, because that's all you have to do. You do you, and you don't worry about anybody else, and you don't worry about how you doing you will affect anybody else. You do you, and I'm going to do me. And so as a result, like the flake factor, right, it's just out of control. I know I said I was coming, but I was tired. I, you know, I know I said I was going to show up for you, but, you know, something came up, and we decided to go on vacation, and there was something else, and I know, you know like, the flake factor is crazy, right? You do your evite, or you do your whatever, and you have no idea who's actually coming. I mean, it could be anything, and it's not just the flake factor. It's worse than that. It's the non-committal factor, so I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to bother telling you I'm coming and then not come. I'm just not going to tell you anything. I'm going to ghost you for weeks until right after the event, and then I'm going to go, 
Oh, was that this weekend? Oh, I'm so sorry. I meant to come. I just don't want to commit to anything in my life. The non-committal factor of people not only like not showing up for your thing, but not committing to their own lives, just the low commitment level. And since true connection and true community requires commitment. Think about that for a second. True connection and true community requires commitment. We are not just uncommitted, we're unconnected. We're unconnected and more isolated and more lonely and depressed and anxious than we've ever been. We are an untrusting generation and we are an untrustworthy generation and we've all been on the receiving end of that. We have all been on the receiving end of that in small ways and big ways, like people who have flaked on you and people have disappointed you and let you down and all of the no-shows that, like, I thought you were going to be there. I thought you said, didn't we talk about this? I was expecting you. I was hoping you would come. You knew how important this night was to me. You knew how important, they knew how important that was to me, and they didn't even show up for it from, from, the, from people who have flaked on us in the small ways and big ways to people who've abandoned us, right? Many of us have been abandoned by uh, parents, I, I was, uh, abandoned by a father or a mother a, or, 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 or betrayals of trust like affairs, Massive breaches of trust by people who should have been trustworthy. You thought you could put some weight on what they said, and you couldn't. And we have all been on the painful, painful receiving end of this. And if we were honest, we have all been at times on the giving end of that as well. And into this wave-tossed, just unstable, anything goes, untrusting, untrustworthy world, Paul says that people who are actually following Jesus, who are actually walking with God's Spirit and how God's Spirit guides us, who are connected to that, they are growing, by definition, in faithfulness. They're growing in faithfulness. They are true and trustworthy, and they have earned the right for people to trust in them because we all want people to trust me. Like, trust me, trust me. Why don't you trust me? It's one thing to want people to trust you. It is another thing to have earned the right to have people trust in them, loyal and reliable and met. They are a met. Now, Paul, uh, he is trained as a Hebrew scholar. He was trained as a rabbi. Uh, he knew the Hebrew scriptures back and forth, but he's writing in Greek. And in Greek, the word family for a met is usually pistis. It's the same thing like faith, believe, faithful, faithfulness. And this is what it means to be Christ-like. This right here is what it means to be Christ-like because this is what Jesus was like. In fact, that is so true that John, one of the eyewitness followers of Jesus, and John, John w closely followed Jesus. He was, he was part of that inner circle, if you will, saw everything Jesus did, heard everything he taught, saw Jesus behind the scenes, knew the real Jesus, if you will. He saw, John saw Jesus die on a cross. John saw an empty tomb, and John had meals and conversations with Jesus after Jesus uh, died and knew that he had rose from dead. In fact, John was so close to Jesus that John is the guy that when Jesus is dying on the cross, he looks at John and says, John, John, take care of my mom for me, will you? And John does. In fact, history tells us that John took care of Mary until she died and kind of traces the track of that. And so John eventually writes his own story of the life of Jesus, like what it was like to be part of that, his own biography of Jesus. And, and in his opening to his story, He's riffing on that famous scene from Exodus. He's just kind of riffing on it where Moses says, show me your glory, just show me your glory, and then I could face anything, and God passing in front of him and declaring his character. And John is actually applying that, scene, that iconic moment from his scriptures to their experience of Jesus. In fact, here's how he writes it in just a single line, though he's riffing on it on a larger section. He's saying, he says, and we have seen his glory. We have seen his glory. That thing that Moses prayed to see, like if you could just show me your glory, we saw his glory, the glory of the only son from the father, the one and only son. And maybe John uses that language a lot. Maybe you've heard it as only begotten son. That's a famous line. It's the same line. Uh, the only true son of the father. And to appreciate how John uses this language, it's helpful maybe to know that the Roman emperors all called themselves the son of God. 
they all referred to themselves as the Son of God, Augustus, Son of God, uh, Tiberius, Son of God, Claudius, Son of God, Nero, Son of God. As John is writing this, it's probably Domitian, Son of God. They all refer to themselves as the Son of God. And John is saying, oh, no, no. I mean, there are a lot of sons of God running around there. Okay. But there is one true true, true son of God. And so saying this has definite political overtones. Do not miss next week and the kickoff of our next series uh, because his letter, Paul's letters to the Thessalonians are very political, though not in the way you might think. And so he's saying, we have seen, we have seen the glory of the one true son, the one who came from the father to make the father known to us full of or abounding in grace and truth. And John is translating here that famous Hebrew line from the book of Exodus into Greek in the, the language he's writing, where hesed, the loyal love, the devoted love of God, the kindness and mercy of God becomes grace. And emet becomes, well, as it was often translated, truth. Truth, meaning not to just that Jesus said things that were true or spoke the truth, but that he was true. He was true as a person. He was faithful. He was constant, just like God himself, the son embodying the father, showing us what God is like. And John's like, we saw that. I mean, we saw the character, the glory of God that Moses wished he could have seen. And we saw it play out personally in front of us every single day. And when you read the stories of Jesus's life, I mean, this is what you're going to see over and over again on the vertical plane, on the vertical plane, he is full of trust in, trusting, and therefore trustworthy or faithful to his father. He says things like, I always do what my father tells him to leads me. I always do what my father's doing. There is never a time where my father is up to something and he's leading me and I go, nah, I'm tired. I'm going to do it. I'm just taking a me day today. There's never a time where he bows out from being faithful or loyal to what his father is all about in that moment. And this faithfulness drove him all the way to the cross. I mean, I mean, it's part of why he came, but he fully embraced the cost of that commitment. He fully embraced what faithfulness would mean and what faithfulness would cost him. And then on the ground level, on the horizontal level, I mean, you follow Jesus through the biographies, the four biographies that, that are written about his life, and you should. Like, if you've never done it, you should start with Matthew's biography and then read through Mark's and Luke's and John's. And what you will see is Jesus was faithful in spite of, and he was reliable regardless. I mean, Jesus was faithful to those who were entrusted to his care. He was faithful to the people around him, not based on how worthy they were of him being faithful, of them being faithful. And this is really key. This is really key. He is faithful to them, not because they are worthy of him sticking it out with them. He is faithful to them out of his faithfulness to his father. They are part of the same thing. Because as you read the stories, I mean, like the people who followed Jesus and the people who were around Jesus, Jesus, they often gave him very little reason to be faithful and loyal and steady and true to them. They are all over the place. I mean, they really are at times just embarrassingly unreliable right to the end on the worst night of his life. The very worst night of his life. Now, I don't know what that is for you. Like, I don't know if you've had a worse night or a worse season or a worse week. Like, this was the darkest it's ever been. This is the hardest it's ever been. And I don't know what you wanted or expected out of your peeps, like your people at that time, like how you might have hoped people would have showed up for you in that dark moment on the worst night of his life when Jesus is arrested. And he's being false, and it's pu very public. He's being falsely cued, as cues, and people are lying about him publicly, and they're spitting on him and punching him in the face and beating him with rods as all of this going, is going on. What do his peeps do? Like, what do his faithful followers do? They disappear. I mean, into thin air. They just vanish. It's like self-protection over loyalty. Yes, please. In fact, one of his closest followers, and this is a famous story, Peter, Peter, uh, denies even knowing who the guy is. While this is happening in front of him, I mean, not two, two feet away, but about 20 feet away, while this is happening, he's being, Jesus is being lied about and spit on, and people are saying all manner of things about him. Peter, Peter says he doesn't even know who the guy is. Like, I never met the guy. I don't even know who you're talking about. And he doesn't just do that one time. Like, I don't know if you've ever had a moment in your life, I know I have, where like, you weren't who you wanted to be and like minutes after, seconds after that moment, you were like, 
Oh, that, I did not show up well there. That was not the best version. That was really bad. And you wanted to like be able to go back and do it again. You've had those moments. Peter doesn't just say this about Jesus once. He says it three times over the course of the night, again and again. Don't know the guy. Back off, buddy. Never met him. Stop connecting the two of us. And, and, and like, I know your friends are bad sometimes. Like, they can be really lame. And you've gotten flaked on and let down. But really? Like, really? And how does Jesus respond to that level of disloyalty and abandonment, right? How does he respond after the resurrection? How does he respond? I know how I would have responded. I would have been like, hey, they'll find the empty tomb. They can come look for me. They'll find it. They'll know something's up. I'll leave them a little clue. I'll fold the stuff up, the, the grave clothes over here. On the, and, they can, and if they find me, well, then they can come crawl into me and apologize. In fact, I'm going to break a little glass over here in front so that when they crawl over, they are bleeding. And then maybe, you've, you've, you've imagined this before, maybe I will I'll let them back in to my circle. But I don't know if I'll ever trust them again. How does Jesus respond? He pursues them, every one of them. He pursues every single one of them, and especially Peter. And he restores them. He doesn't just forgive them. He restores the relationship. He restores the trust. He takes the initiative to do that because that's what true faithfulness looks like and acts like and reacts like. He was full of chesed and emet. He was full full of grace and truth. See, returning, returning faithfulness for faithfulness, that's easy. That's easy, right? Being loyal to the people who are really loyal to you, uh, sticking by the people who stick by you, showing up for the people that showed up for your thing, that's easy. Well, it's kind of, I mean, even that is kind of challenging sometimes. Like, I know they showed up to my thing, but I'm just tired. I've had a tough week, but still it's like, ah, they showed up. That's easy. But returning faithfulness for unfaithfulness, that's Christ-like. That's Christ-like. Faithfulness in an unfaithful world, becoming a really loyal person in a disloyal world is the ultimate expression of the faithfulness of Christ. That is Christ-like and, and this is a big idea, and it is the authentic expression of our faith in and faithfulness to Christ. It's the authentic expression of what faith in Christ is actually all about. Now, maybe you were raised in a form of Christianity and there's a lot out there that drew a really hard and fast line between your religion and your reality. Like your religion and your relationships, between the vertical and the horizontal. It's like believing in Christ. <laughs> I mean, I believe in Christ. That has nothing to do with becoming like Christ. That's a whole extra deal. Faith in Christ has nothing to do with faithfulness. But for Jesus and for his first followers, that would have been the furthest thing from his mind and the furthest thing from what following him actually meant and what it actually looks like. And for Paul, who was, by the way, the champion of what faith in Christ and faithfulness to Christ looks like, he could not have been clearer or more emphatic that faith and faithfulness, the faith and faithfulness, the vertical and the horizontal are part of one integrated whole in the character of a person who's following Jesus. And this Faithfulness is actually what God wants to, and Paul says, will grow in you as you follow and you keep step in the Spirit, not just a growing faith, but a growing faithfulness. Ours, ours is an, a, a world of increasing distrust, right? And with that untrustworthiness, it's just kind of like an absence of loyalty anywhere in the world. The flake factor, the non-committal factor are just crazy off the, you know, off the charts. And this all feeds the further fracturing and segmenting and disintegrating of our webs of relationships, whether those are our families, our societies, our communities. And I believe it furthers the fracturing of our own souls our own inner worlds, because we were created for community. We were created for long-standing attachment and connection with one another, which means we were created for commitment, <laughs> commitment that far exceeds our convenience or comfort at the time. We were created in God's own image to be people of a met, rocks for one another, rocks, steady and true and constant and reliable and worthy of people putting their trust in us. Now, you think about that for a second. 
Just think about what that would feel like or what that would look like to have a bunch of people like that, that that's who surrounds you, right? Just imagine what that would be like, even if you don't want to become one of those people, because seriously, I mean, this is costly. Like what we're talking about, I mean, like always true, like always showing up to everything I say I'm going to show up for, like, I don't know, can't I be like mostly and so like... What if I did have a bad week? Hello. And even if you don't really want to become that person, I guarantee you this. It's what you want everybody else to be. It's what you want everybody ar around you to be, isn't it? In fact, it's what you think they should be, which is why you get so upset when they aren't. It's what you hope your spouse will be, certainly. That they'll be true. A person who's true, true to their word, true to their vow, true to their commitment, true with you. It's what you think your boyfriend or your girlfriend should be. It is certainly what you hope your kid's spouse will be. If you got kids, like somewhere down the road, I sure hope my kid finds someone who's faithful, who is a met. It is the kind of friends you wish you had, the kind of community you want to have. It is the kind of boss you would love to work for and you don't, right? Because your boss, you can't believe a single word that comes out of that person's mouth and they are loyal to themselves and you wish you had a boss that was a met. It's the kind of, if you're, if you're a boss, it's the kind of employees, you're like, where do I even find that? Like, where does that show up on Indeed or LinkedIn? Like, hey, these are faithful people. They're gonna tell the truth. They're gonna be reliable. They're gonna show up. They're not gonna rip me off. Like, I wanna hire a whole bunch of them. And it is what we wish our nation's leaders were. It is what we wish our political candidates would always be true, like not only just saying things that would be a great start, like saying things that are true, but then true, like really true, not true to themselves. Everybody can be true to themselves in any given moment. True to us, true to, the, true to, true to everybody else. And though you're not always all the way there yet, and I am certainly not 100% there yet, I think even if you're not really a Christian, so even if you're not really like, I'm not really sure about the God, Bible, faith, Jesus part of it, I bet that this is what, like in your best moments, in those moments where you are just in tune with the best part of yourself, this is what you wish you were. This is what you wish you would become. See, what the world needs right now, it's Christians to actually be Christ-like. And bigger than that, whole Jesus-following communities to actually be Jesus-like. What our world needs now, wouldn't you agree, is some emet. That the world actually could so use some emet right now. And who's supposed to bring that? Who's supposed to bring the emet to the world? See, what the world needs right now is people of faith whose lives with others exude faithfulness. People who have this Christ-like quality of faith and faithfulness growing, increasing in them. People who are true, true. They say what's true. They do what's true. They have earned the right to have other people trust them and put their trust in them. People whose, whose word is true, whose character is constant, meaning they are the same week to week to week, year to year to year. They are just steady and constant. They are the same behind your back as they are to your face. What the world needs now is people whose commitments are kept regardless the cost, whose confidentiality is trusted. Like, oh, you told John that? Oh, it's safe. Oh, it'll never be in the wind. Oh, you told that to your life group? You're solid. They will cover you. You are good to go. Their commitment is trusted, whose integrity is impeccable, whose dealings are righteous. And this word righteous is one of the words most frequently associated with faithfulness or met throughout the Hebrew scriptures, especially meaning someone who always does the right thing. That's what that word means. They're always going to do the right thing and they're always going to do right by you. Everything they do will be righteous because they are faithful and they will never be shading anything for their own benefit that goes against you. They're going to they're gonna do the right thing and you can count on them doing the right thing. And imagine what our world would look like. I mean, think about it. Imagine what workplaces would look like. I mean, this would transform the economy, right? Workplaces would be so efficient and so great to work for. Imagine what families and extended families would look like, what your neighborhood would look like, what our schools would look like, what politics would look like, what our government would look like. If every person who was created in the image of God, and we all are, were people like God of a met. But hey, never mind everybody else. Because we can't tell anybody else what to do. We can't say what everybody else should be doing. 
what if just everybody who called themselves Christian? Christian, which, by the way, is roughly 70% of the American population that checks that box, two th uh, or one-third of the world's population, 2.3 billion people on this planet. If every person just who called themselves Christian were a person of joy and peace and shalom always and kindness and that they were faithful, true, and trustworthy, earning the right to have people trust them, always loyal, always reliable, would this world maybe be a better place, you think? See, our nation right now is focused on who our world needs now. And hey, elections matter, policies matter, absolutely, economy matters, all of those things matter. But this election season and beyond, why don't we be what our world needs now? And I hope you'll join us with that in mind next weekend as we kick off our brand new series, While We Wait. Let me close this in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I, I don't know how this lands for everybody. We've all had trust broken, and many of us have broken trust, and there might be this sense of ouch that goes with this. So we want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you that you are so faithful to us even when we break faith, even when we break trust. You are so faithful, so consistent. You are full of chesed and emet, loving, devoted kindness. You are completely devoted, unfailingly competent, always. And so speaking for myself and maybe for us as a community, we lean into you today and just ask, not just that you would forgive us, not just that, that, that you would be faithful to cleanse our hearts, but that you would actually grow in us your own character, that you would grow in us the faithfulness that this world needs us to be, that we would truly be Christ-like. And I pray that for myself just going in this week, that I would be so mindful of my word and what is true and being loyal to that and loyal to the people around me. I pray that for myself, that you would give me eyes to see how that rolls into my day and my week. And I pray that for every single one of us, that this would just be front of mind throughout the week as we become faithful, faithful people. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>